dreams. No doubt, for as long as we've had them, we've been fascinated by them. Some of the earliest written texts from the ancient Sumerians describe dreams, interpretations of them, the meaning of them. Because of course to us, dreams are not just the random, mundane products of the unconscious mind. We may not remember most of them, but when we do remember our dreams, our experiences and emotions can have a powerful effect on us, even after we wake up. Why? What are dreams? Why do we dream? What's the history? What's the science? What's the story behind dreams? Do they have meaning? Do they say important things or reflect who we are? Furthermore, can I take control of my dreams? What is sleep paralysis? Why is it so hard to remember my dreams? In this video, we will answer all these questions and more as we explore the world of dreams. Before we begin, I would like to thank Gabriel Lund, Shimmerzen, Zach and Danny, Evgeny Zakharov, Virtual Happiness Syndrome, and Avast User for being our most recent supporters on Patreon. They join these supporters who make these videos possible. I was back in high school. I don't know why. I haven't even been inside my high school building for years. I rarely ever even think about it, but there I was wandering the halls on the morning of the first day of the year. I was searching for my classes, but I was having trouble finding them. As I wandered through the hallways, I saw people I hadn't seen in years, my old classmates, teachers, and friends, but I was too busy to talk. I simply couldn't find my history class. They had started to really bug me. I began to search frantically. I would try to read the numbers on the classroom doors, but they would change when I looked at them. I was going to be late. I became anxious, unreasonably anxious. I would never make it. I'd miss everything. I'd never find my history class, and I'd be wandering the halls forever. Finally, I found it. But as I opened the door to walk in, suddenly, everything changed. Almost all the lights in the school were now off. It was suddenly nighttime. The room was empty, and in fact the whole school was empty. I was suddenly alone in the whole school at night. But was I really alone? I felt something. I couldn't hear or see anyone, but I felt the presence of someone else in the school. It was watching me, coming closer. As I felt it nearly upon me, I tried to run, but I couldn't. I was practically paralyzed. Move, I kept thinking, but I just couldn't. Then, right before it was upon me, I woke up. Does this sound familiar? I imagine to most of you, at least some of these things did. I'll be happy to share some of my dreams in this video, but this dream I made up, using events and emotions commonly reported in dreams. I created a stereotypical dream, I guess you could say. This sort of thing is important. Though our dreams can be wildly unique, being often stories we would never think of consciously, researchers have noticed that people's dreams do share certain elements, and identifying commonalities is very important in helping scientists understand why we dream. To understand dreaming, we first have to understand why we even sleep to begin with. It's good to be curious about sleep. We spend quite a bit of time doing it after all, needing on average about 8 hours of sleep a night. Some of us need more, and in fact children need more, but some of us do fine with less. Thankfully, everyone easily always gets the required amount of sleep every night, and insomnia is never a problem for anyone, right? It all adds up to us spending about a third of our lives asleep, which includes about six years of dreaming. That is a lot of time spent doing nothing. Think of how many more Fire of Learning videos I could make if I didn't need to sleep. Well, unfortunately, there isn't much way around it. Cutting back to unhealthy levels of sleep, especially for long durations, has negative consequences on our mood, attention span, immune system, energy level, appearance, that's right, beauty sleep is a thing, weight, memory, and eventually, life expectancy. Staying up for days at a time can have debilitating short-term effects on our mental and physical health, and eventually, staying up for weeks will cause someone to die of exhaustion. Furthermore, lack of sleep is a factor in an estimated 20% of car accidents. So much for sleeping when we're dead. Scientists don't understand everything about sleep, but it is clear. Sleep is a basic necessity. We need it like food and water. 
Nearly all animals join us in doing it, from dogs and cats to mice and rats to sheep and bats to land crabs, which suggests that not only is it necessary, but it even offers a survival advantage. That's a bit surprising. Lying unconscious for eight hours in the dark doesn't seem like the best way to survive in the wilderness, but it seems to be true. Why? Well, for the body, sleep is a time of much-needed regeneration. Wounds heal, muscles grow, toxins are flushed out of the brain, hormones are released that, for example, help children grow, our body uses sleep for maintenance and repairs. This documentary is more about the brain than the body, though, and as it happens, the brain is the main focus of sleep research. Inside our heads at night is a bewildering and incredibly fascinating mystery. Our brains are not really off during sleep, not really even figuratively when talking scientifically. The only time a normal brain is off is during a coma or when one is under general anesthesia or something along those lines. In fact, in certain phases of sleep, the brain is quite active, with certain areas being more active than in waking life, such as the limbic system. This is the door to understanding dreaming. There are four phases of sleep. NREM 1, NREM 2, NREM 3, and REM sleep. NREM 3, by the way, used to be divided into NREM 3 and 4, and it is sometimes still listed as such, but in this video we will recognize that they have been conjoined. REM stands for Rapid Eye Movement. NREM just stands for non-REM. As you might expect, REM takes its name from Rapid Eye Movement. When someone is in this phase, you can actually catch their eyes moving around rapidly, even though they're fast asleep. Although, uh, I don't really do this anymore because watching people sleep is evidently frowned upon even when undertaken in the pursuit of knowledge. Anyway. In a full night's sleep, you go through each of these stages about four to six times a night, with each cycle lasting around an hour and a half. We'll go through what happens in these stages in a moment, but believe it or not, maybe you can tell, to an extent, which stage you or even someone else is in without the fancy electroencephalograms that scientists use. How? Well, let's start with this. Have you ever heard that, apparently, scientists say that it takes an hour and a half before we start dreaming? If you dream like I do, you were probably skeptical when you first heard this. I dream during 10 minute naps. A lot of people do. How could they say this? It must be wrong. Well, this isn't exactly what they say. Consider those dreams you have during short naps or the beginning of sleep versus those that you have during a full night's sleep. Are the dreams during long periods of sleep much more vivid, story-like, and emotional than the random, more mundane images and sounds and such of a quick nap? Do you have many powerful nightmares in 10 minute naps? Well, there we have it. The powerful dreams are generally the product of REM sleep. Scientists say it takes about an hour and a half before we first enter REM sleep, not dreaming, REM dreams specifically. Dream type is a way of telling which phase you're in. All right, let's go through this. Let's go to sleep. NREM 1 is the phase in which you begin transitioning into sleep. As you slowly begin to fall asleep, brain activity changes. People who are awoken in this stage do sometimes claim to be dreaming, however, other participants would describe it as a kind of thinking, and might not feel that they were actually fully asleep yet. It's a kind of in-between phase. You may also experience some forms of strange auditory, tactile, or even visual hallucinations in NREM1 called hypnagogic hallucinations, such as hearing thunder as a kind of voice talking to you after you've had too much coffee. Oh, and let's not forget, you may also fall off a building. Many people occasionally experience a sudden startle while falling asleep that causes them to jump and wake up, as if they were about to fall off a building. That is called a hypnic jerk. It's completely normal and can be the result of something as simple as caffeine. This stage represents about 5 to 10% of total sleep. Next, we transition into NREM 2, which represents about 45 to 55% of sleep. This is deeper sleep. We start to become much less aware of our surroundings in this phase. We don't often dream in this stage, and when we do, it's almost like an unconscious thinking type of dreaming. Then we reach NREM 3. This is also called slow wave sleep. It is the deepest phase of sleep, representing 15 to 25% of a full night's sleep. Your heart rate and breathing slow, and your body temperature drops. It's in stage three that we tend to do things like sleepwalk, sleep talk, wet the bed, or experience night terrors. 
Children under the age of 12 are much more prone to each of these things. Night terrors, by the way, not the same thing as nightmares. Night terrors refer to an activity very similar to sleepwalking in which the sufferer appears to be panicked and threatened while asleep. Interestingly, these behaviors aren't as associated with dreaming as we might think. Many people who are awoken during sleepwalking or night terrors often have no memory of it and do not claim to have been dreaming. Although some do, and I personally can think of examples where I woke myself up talking to someone in a dream that carried on in person for a moment. There is such a thing as people acting out their dreams in full, but that tends to refer to a very different situation. We'll come back to sleepwalking. We do dream in NREM 3, as I said, although like the first two phases, it isn't as common, and dreams are referred to as less vivid and story-like. Again, somewhat like thinking or remembering things or going through things in a deep sleep. The mind kind of wandering and not necessarily building complex stories that we feel we're acting out. You could call them less impactful or less memorable dreams. We then go back into NREM 2, but after this, we reach REM. And this is where the dreaming really begins. REM sleep accounts for 20 to 25 percent of sleep time. It's sometimes called paradoxical sleep because something strange occurs in this state. By looking at brain activity readings of this stage, the brain basically looks awake. Yet, people are fast asleep, and in fact, it is in this stage that people are the most difficult to wake up. Your heart rate and breathing pick back up. Certain areas of the brain, namely those involved in memory and emotion, have even higher levels of blood flow than during waking hours, an important clue as to what's going on. Naturally, scientists researching dreams tend to focus most on this phase. One area of the brain, though, that isn't very active, which likely does not surprise you, is the prefrontal cortex. In other words, the area involved in logic, reason, and self-awareness. This likely explains why we aren't very self-aware in dreams, and why dreams are a bit, well, nonsensical at times. We'll spend about 5 to 20 minutes dreaming per cycle, adding up to up to 2 hours or so of REM dreaming a night. Do we all actually dream though? Many people say they don't, or do so rarely. It's actually relatively rare to not dream, usually only found in victims of brain damage. For the majority of us, we go on these subconscious adventures every night, multiple times a night. We just don't remember it well. The areas involved with memory are active during REM, however, the processes of recording memories are usually very inactive. That might be for a reason. If our brains were filled with memories from dreams, it might be distracting in waking life. According to researchers, around 90-95% to of a dream is forgotten within 10 minutes of waking up, which is why if you're recording dreams, it's important to do so as soon as you wake up. As I said, you do dream in all stages of sleep, notably NREM 3. However, if you do dream in NREM 3, usually, interestingly, it happens later on in sleep, which is likely related to the increasing intensity of REM. Following this first period of REM, you often return to stage 2, and the process restarts. In the early period of sleep, NREM 3 lasts longer. However, as the night progresses, as I said, it becomes shorter, and REM lasts longer, allowing dreams to last longer, which likely explains both why most sleepwalking and talking occur in the early hours of sleep, whereas our most vibrant dreams occur shortly before we wake up in the morning. Sleep is a lot more complicated than we imagined, but understanding this complexity is key to understanding dreams. So with that out of the way, why do we do it at all? Scientists aren't exactly sure. However, they have a number of very fascinating theories, and a combination of different ones seems plausible, especially considering that many are related. Nearly all cultures and religions have endeavored to address dreaming. In the Abrahamic religions, 
Dreams are seen as opportunities for lessons, and more importantly, they teach that dreams may have divine meaning. They may be the word of God. Examples of this are found in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Native Americans likewise believed that dreams had important meaning, that they were windows into the soul or contained messages from ancestors. The ancient Egyptians, ancient Greeks and Romans, and ancient Celts also had their ideas on how to interpret dreams, believing that they had some significance. Buddhism, Hinduism, the animist religions of Africa, the natives of Australia. It's difficult to find a culture or belief system that doesn't place some importance on dreaming. Are dreams occasionally, or even often, messages from the divine, messages from our ancestors, or even prophetic visions of the future? Maybe, maybe not. Regardless of whether or not scientists think that they are, science itself can't say either way because these things can't really be tested in a laboratory. However, the very common belief that dreams have a purpose, that they mean something, that they represent something about ourselves, this can be better tested, though it isn't easy. Because dreams are a subjective experience for the most part, you have to rely on the dreamer's account of a dream, and these accounts are often unreliable, owing to how easily we forget dreams and mix things up. If it isn't recorded as soon as you wake up, errors often occur. This is, of course, why we can't be sure whether or not animals dream, or have any idea what those dreams would be like. Almost all mammals, from monkeys to goats, have similar sleep cycles to us. They go into REM, you can even see their eyes moving. Dogs often certainly look like they're chasing a squirrel or something like that sometimes, but we still don't know what's going on in their heads for sure. For the purposes of this documentary, I asked my dog if he dreams, and if so, what he dreams about, and he said, Arf. You heard it here first, folks. Serious scientific study of dreaming, called oneirology, from the Greek word for dream, oneiron, began in the 19th and 20th centuries by figures such as Sigmund Freud, who wrote extensively about dreams, publishing books on how to interpret them. He believed that they were an expression of the unconscious mind, a manifestation of things that were repressed in waking life, specifically things of a sexual nature. Unfortunately for Freud, but I suppose fortunately for the rest of us, as is so often the case for him, his ideas don't appear to have been scientifically valid. However, as the 20th century progressed, we gained a better insight into dreaming and why we may do it. I was a young boy, playing in the indoor play place in a fast food restaurant with all the other kids, a normal, fun time. I looked down from above the tunnels I climbed up and saw my mother sitting there, around all the other parents, patiently letting us all play. As I went through the tunnels of the play place, however, I eventually realized I was on my own. I looked out to the rest of the room, and suddenly, it was night. There was a dim, green glow in the room. Everyone was gone, and I was on my own. Through the doors came a large, creepy, zombie-like man. He entered the play place. I recall him running to climb into the tunnels that I was in to reach me. And then, I woke up. This dream from my childhood is one of the earliest ones I remember. I suppose at the time it disturbed me enough to where I remember it to this day. It's not an uncommon kind of dream to have as a child, or in general really. Even for most emotionally and mentally healthy people, most dreams are negative. The most commonly reported emotions in dreams are negative ones. Fear. Anxiety, sadness, anger, embarrassment. The sleeping mind often takes us to places that we don't want to go. The worst of these are called nightmares, and indeed, there is a difference between a nightmare and a bad dream. Generally, a nightmare refers to a dream that has such a strong negative emotional effect on us that we wake up. In both circumstances, we may dream of fighting, of our partner cheating on us, of being followed or chased by suspicious, malevolent people and beings, of the death of a loved one, of being humiliated in front of others, of being caught in an inescapable disaster like a tsunami or a fire, and of, frankly, quite dark things. Otherworldly beings, dark creatures, evil places, and horrible stories. This leads scientists to a theory about dreaming. To understand this, we have to understand the areas of the brain most active during sleep, specifically REM. These are, again, the emotional processing and memory areas, such as the amygdala and hippocampus. The brain might actually be preparing us 
for negative situations. This is called threat simulation theory. Think of the holodeck in Star Trek, where you can run simulations to prepare for dangerous situations, without the danger. I guess that would be a good example if something didn't go horribly, ridiculously wrong with the holodeck in every episode. But, uh, anyway. This may be what our brain is doing. The brain during REM, as we've mentioned, is quite similar to the waking brain. In fact, basically, as far as the brain is concerned, we are awake. In the moment, our REM dreams are reality. Dreaming, then, may have developed as a way to prepare our brains to handle the situations of which we are most fearful before they happen. The brain might be training itself to handle a fight, a humiliation, a loss, an enemy that we fear in waking life, anything along those lines. It's a fascinating, though imperfect, theory. Does it make sense to prepare ourselves for a world where we could be confronted by malevolent zombies? Well, okay, that does kind of happen, but we do dream about a lot of unrealistic things as well. Furthermore, while many of our dreams are negative, many are positive or neutral, and the majority are not profound enough to be truly memorable. If this theory holds true, the brain wouldn't be assessing the likelihood of the dream content actually happening, it would just be preparing us for situations that emotionally impact us. Other theories focus on another aspect of sleeping. One thing that occurs in the brain during sleep is memory consolidation. Though it should be noted that it is not fully understood to what extent sleep plays in memory, nor exactly how it works. Studies have shown that sleep, both REM and NREM3 sleep, have an impact on memory. Essentially, what the brain may be doing is sorting through the experiences you've had throughout your day, strengthening memories that are deemed important while deleting memories that are unimportant noise. An example would be strengthening the memory of the routes that you take to your classes on your first day of school while forgetting what color clothing your teachers are wearing. Generally, it seems that NREM3 sleep has a larger effect on explicit or declarative memory, which is the ability to remember factual information, concepts, and experiences, whereas REM seems to have more of an effect on implicit memory, which includes things like procedural memory, emotional memory, and spatial memory. Things you subconsciously remember, or basically remember in different parts of the brain. Studies show that a short nap doesn't improve one's ability to do something like ride a bike or play an instrument very much, but a night of REM sleep does. The fact that these two different phases of sleep have an effect on two different kinds of memory, which are different areas of the brain, likely has a lot to do with why the dreams reported in these phases are notably different from each other. One thing that scientists like Matt Wilson have discovered that reinforces this are profound studies on both mice and humans concerning memory replaying itself at night. What they have done is looked at brain activity during the day while an individual completes a task. For mice, this would be something like running through a maze. At every step of the maze, the researchers record the mental activity of the mice so specifically that they can later place the mouse in the same maze again and estimate correctly where the mouse is based off the brain activity alone. Impressive, but it goes deeper. When a mouse, or a human, goes to sleep, researchers can see activity being replayed in different ways in the brain depending on the sleep stage. In NREM3, the neurons that fired while the mouse was going through the maze will be replayed very quickly, sometimes backwards, likely to strengthen the connection, to reinforce what the brain has learned. This registers as a prediction of where the mouse is on the maze. Indeed, in humans and mice, it can be observed that areas of the brain that control the areas of the body involved heavily in the experiences of the day tend to sleep more deeply during sleep. In REM sleep, however, the memories are replayed, but they are replayed in real time, as if the brain were actually awake and experiencing it. Multiple findings support the association between REM and memory. When new tasks are learned throughout the day, people spend more time in REM sleep. When REM sleep is disrupted, people have a harder time remembering things associated with it, i.e. non-declarative memory. Though I should mention, not all studies show this. Some studies do show that people chronically deprived of REM don't suffer from memory problems. Another clue is that we tend to spend a lot of time in REM when we're young, the ages when we're first learning about how the world works. Fetuses spend much of their time in REM, babies do too. Babies under six months old spend about half their sleep, in REM. The amount of time we spend in REM slowly diminishes with age. 
Scientists believe this may be a sign of REM's importance to learning and cognitive development. Another purpose of REM sleep may be to take memories and information gathered throughout the day, which are then strengthened in NREM3, and then not simply to replay them, but to experiment with them, to compare them with past experiences and create novel associations. This would explain the bizarre nature of dreams. As I mentioned, the logical areas, or the left-brained areas of the brain, are turned off during REM sleep, which is likely why dreams lack sense, or more precisely, why we don't notice that they lack sense. These dreams are fascinating, yet utterly bizarre, but that may be the point, to associate things that we wouldn't normally in our waking lives. Indeed, a number of inventions and ideas are attributed to dreams. A famous example is that of American inventor Elias Howe, who invented the sewing machine in 1846. After being stumped on how to create the machine, he went to bed. He dreamt he was kidnapped by tribal peoples, whose king demanded that he invent the sewing machine within 24 hours. He failed, and the tribesmen gathered around him and began lunging their spears into him. However, as they did so, he noticed something peculiar about their spears. There was a hole in the top of them. They were shaped like the sewing needle ought to be. He ran out of bed at 4 in the morning, and evidently by 9, he had his invention working. How much of a role did the dream play? Was it the deciding factor, or was it a conclusion that Howe would have reached eventually anyway? It's hard to say, but scientists have shown that REM sleep does help people be more creative. Researchers who awaken study participants during REM sleep find that, when asked to complete tasks that require creative problem solving in the middle of the night, again, while they were in the middle of REM, they perform better on those tasks. Adding on to this, we tend to dream more when we're under stress or in new environments. Some researchers note that this may be the brain's way of trying to solve problems in our waking life, which also can relate back to threat simulation theory. Repetitive dreams are quite common for people with post-traumatic stress disorder, and often, these dreams focus on the events through which they suffered. 71% of people with PTSD suffer from regular nightmares, many of whom have recurring ones. This may be the brain's way of problem solving with REM, though it would be specifically about solving emotional problems. Another thing that occurs during REM sleep is emotional consolidation. Have you ever gone to bed worrying about an issue and woken up the next day feeling a little bit better about it? Again, this is possibly not coincidence. The brain possibly uses REM sleep to go over the emotions you felt throughout the day, and dreaming may be related to this process as well. The emotions we feel in dreams are commonly powerful, but not all bad. Very pleasant things happen in dreams as well. Exploring a new world. Relaxing with friends and family. Falling in love. Reuniting with someone long gone. Going back to simpler times. The brain may be using dreams to run through emotional memories in general, not just the bad ones. Again to aid us in life in general, not just negative situations. That's all well and good, but there's another important question to be asked. Is dreaming itself what's important or is it a byproduct of the actual important activity in the brain? Some scientists suggest that while REM sleep may be very important, dreams themselves are simply the sleeping mind's attempt to make sense of what's going on in the rest of the brain. It's possibly just forming a story out of the arbitrary signals it's receiving from the brain structures involved in REM. According to scientists like Robert Stickgold of Harvard Medical School, the reason that such randomness may be perceived as profound is that our minds are simply specifically reviewing useful information during REM. The dreams themselves may not be the actually important part. Similar things have been said about our emotions. 
Some scientists suggest that it's not our dreams that evoke such strong emotions in us, but rather the strong emotions that we may be feeling in REM are what guide our dreams. Adding to the idea that dreams are inherently meaningless and just responses to stimuli is how the waking world can influence dreams. A car honking, someone talking to you, being too hot or cold, etc. All these things have been known to sometimes influence dreams. Your dog starts barking, and for a brief time before you wake up, your dog may enter your dream. Frankly, scientists don't agree, and that's perfectly fine. There's a lot more we have to understand about dreams before we can focus on a single explanation, and indeed, there are more explanations. These were just the main ones. A diversity of opinion is necessary. It is possible that dreams are ultimately pointless, but that would leave a lot of questions unanswered. One thing that may provide a very important insight into why we dream is what happens when dreaming gets strange. I dreamt I was in the middle of a very barren, gray landscape. It was evening and the sun was going down, though it wasn't visible behind the gray clouds. I was alone except for my baby whom I carried in my arms. I slowly began to approach an ocean off in the distance. As I came to the edge of the water, I walked in ankle deep. It was cold. I then placed my child inside the water. It did not react and began to float out into the ocean. I felt horribly empty, though I did not follow the child. I felt it had to be done. Then I woke up. Pregnant women who later miscarry sometimes report having these types of dreams. People in general may dream about being sick or developing a disorder before the conscious brain recognizes it. There are numerous reports of this having occurred people experiencing dreams before a miscarriage, before developing a cold, or before developing a fatal illness that seem to be eerily precisely indicative of what's coming. Maybe there's truth to this. The ancient Greek physician Hippocrates used to ask people about their dreams while treating them, in fact. Scientists are open to the idea that the REM brain may have a better ability to scan the body and detect abnormalities, which then translate into dreams. Recall, of course, stimuli from outside the brain can influence dreams. They're open to it, but this would be difficult to test and prove. How does one design an experiment to test this? A number of problems arise when thinking about how to design such experiments. Firstly, people being aware that they're being tested could, in fact, likely would influence their dreams. Or dream recall. It's also possible to interpret dreams in basically any way you want. Especially if you're just looking at a single incident. Maybe a man being choked by a ghost is a sign of an impending lung condition, or maybe he's just dreaming about violent ghosts. Perfectly healthy pregnant women dream about miscarriages all the time. Some dreams are eerily specific, but while many people are honest, there are likely a lot of other people who kind of claim to have dreamt about an experience post hoc after the fact, likely because, well, they're making it up. Well, for now, we'll label this phenomenon as a fascinating maybe. For now though, there are other weird dream phenomena to cover. A question you may have asked about REM. If our brains are acting out our dreams during sleep, why don't we physically act them out? The answer is REM atonia. During REM, the body becomes paralyzed, except of course in the eyes, which is the namesake, and the diaphragm, so that you can breathe. This prevents us from the dangers that could come to us and others from acting out our dreams in the real world. But it's also responsible for another phenomenon. Sometimes, when we wake up during REM, we may experience sleep paralysis. Alien abductions. The thing about many of the reports is that they sound quite a bit like what happens in sleep paralysis. Not so much the behavior you would expect from a civilization thousands of years ahead of us. Sleep paralysis occurs when you partially 
awaken during REM sleep. You are awake enough to be aware of your surroundings, but asleep enough to still be dreaming. It's very often a negative experience. Naturally, awakening and feeling paralyzed is going to cause someone strong anxiety in itself. The dreaming brain then may pick up on that, and it's all downhill from there. Many people never experience it. If you're like me, you may notice yourself be paralyzed from time to time during sleep, but not see any hallucinations or really even open your eyes and then just fall back asleep. For some people though, it's a terrifying experience of dreamlike hallucinations on the semi-awake mind. Reports of such events do not include just aliens, and in fact, they long predate alien abduction reports. Ghosts, demons, vampires, dark entities, etc. All reported to visit people and their sleep through history. Oftentimes, the victim may simply lie paralyzed in their beds while experiencing any or all of three main reported sensations. Firstly, feeling a dark, malevolent presence in the room, or actually observing a ghastly figure. Secondly, an evil being sitting on top of your chest, possibly assaulting you, preventing you from breathing. Thirdly, a form of levitation, being raised by a ghost or perhaps being lifted into a spaceship. Generally, these experiences only last for a few minutes, but looking back on them, they can seem like they last the whole night. Evidently, a minority of those who experience it report enjoying the experience. I suppose if you knew it was coming, it would be easier to control your emotions. Like many sleep disorders, it's probably a very genetic phenomenon, affecting mostly those under the age of 25, although certain environmental influences like a change in sleep schedule or medication no doubt contribute as well. In total, an estimated one-third of the population may experience sleep paralysis in their lives, though estimations vary based on how the questions are phrased. I suppose you could say that sleep paralysis is when the dreaming brain takes control of the conscious brain. But what about the conscious brain taking control of the dreaming brain? In other words, is it possible to be aware of your dreams during them and to take control of them? There is indeed such a thing. It is known as lucid dreaming. With practice, using a variety of methods, people report being able to realize they are dreaming and then being able to consciously take control of where the dream goes. Lucid dreamers, or oneironauts as they call themselves, apparently, seem to have science on their side. Reports of lucid dreaming date back to the ancient Greeks. In 1867, Marie-Jean Léon Lecoq published the book Dreams and the Ways to Direct Them, Practical Observations, in which he not only discusses his experiences with lucid dreaming, but instructs readers on how they may learn to do it themselves. In 1913, the term lucid dreaming was coined by Frederick von Aden, a Dutch psychiatrist. Since then, a number of studies have backed up the claims of lucid dreamers. In these studies, researchers ask lucid dreamers to move their eyes to count to 10 when they realize that they're dreaming. To their surprise, the lucid dreaming individual is sometimes able to give the prearranged signal once they take control of their dream. Findings like this, by the way, suggest that the passage of time in dreams is the same as in waking life. It's only after we wake up and remember dreams that we think that they lasted longer or shorter than they did. I've never done it so I can't offer any personal advice, but from what I've read, it seems to be first about finding a way to recognize that you're dreaming. Generally, this involves doing something like repeating a behavior in waking life, like looking at a word written on your hand or the time on the clock. When you fall asleep and dream, because this behavior is repeated throughout the day, you'll quite possibly do it in your sleep. However, because the areas of your brain involved in logic and such what are called left-brained areas are off, the word and time will change or not quite make sense. This is supposed to trigger the realization that you're dreaming and allow you to become self-aware. Again, according to the lucid dreamer, lucid dreaming is fairly precarious at first. It's quite easy to fall back into regular sleep or to wake yourself up, or possibly even go into sleep paralysis. It's an activity that requires balance and practice. But to what extent? Can you control your dreams? Scientists aren't sure. This is really too much of a subjective experience to objectively measure from outside the sleeping mind. There's much more about lucid dreaming that has to be understood. Now let's turn back to sleep paralysis. I mentioned that remetonia is what prevents us from acting out our dreams by paralyzing us. 
What happens when its paralysis is disabled? You would be correct in assuming that sleepwalking occurs. However, it's generally a different kind of sleepwalking. The relationship between dreams and sleepwalking is not fully understood, though scientists believe that sleepwalking, or somnambulism, if you want to use a fancy Latin word, most of the time is not related to dreams. People awoken during typical sleepwalking don't usually remember being in a dream, because generally, as I mentioned earlier, most sleepwalking occurs in NREM3. However, there is a disorder called RBD, REM Sleep Behavior Disorder, where we do act out our dreams, because this paralysis has been turned off. People have been known to hold conversations, to fight, to yell, to jump out of bed, and perform all sorts of behaviors in REM with this disorder, which presents a danger to both themselves and their bedmates, which could potentially be lethal, especially given that most dreams are negative. These behaviors also occur during NREM3 sleepwalking too, and in fact, NREM3 sleepwalkers have been known to drive cars, cook food, climb cranes, and even commit murders. However, sleepwalking itself is not necessarily a sign of an issue in the brain, especially for children who do it most often. It's very likely genetic and can be triggered by trivial things, essentially being the brain in a state of arousal while also still in deep sleep. RBD, however, is almost always a sign of another issue, and about 98% of people who suffer from RBD go on to develop a disorder such as Parkinson's or dementia. RBD is most commonly found in males in middle age or older, and is rather rare. In either case though, it's usually perfectly fine to wake up a sleepwalker, it won't hurt them, and in fact, you generally should. Another phenomenon, or more correctly, a disorder associated with REM, probably the worst of these is where sleep attacks you in waking life. Narcolepsy. Narcolepsy generally begins in the teenage years or early 20s. It is a neurological disorder, characterized by falling asleep randomly and uncontrollably in the middle of a waking life, literally called a sleep attack. What happens is that sufferers of this disorder fall directly into REM sleep, as I said, generally uncontrollably. Oftentimes, it may be triggered by strong emotions or excitement. This may result in something called cataplexy, which is either a partial or full paralysis. As you might have guessed, this is related to rametonia. They may also experience hallucinations and have trouble distinguishing reality and the dream world while in this phase. Sleep interrupts their days, but they also tend to have very disrupted nights as well, constantly waking up. Essentially, the normal sleep cycle in a person with narcolepsy is disrupted, and they suffer going in between wakefulness and REM. As a side note, they may have these stereotypical REM dreams during very quick naps, as a result. Occurrences like these, like much of this field in general, require further study and analysis. Speaking of studies though, let's now turn to another fascinating area of dream research and discuss what do people really dream about? Does what we dream about have a deeper meaning? Does it say something about ourselves? By analyzing our dreams, can we discover things about our lives? To an extent, I would say, yes of course. The focus of our dreams tends to be on what we focus on in waking life, or at least that's where it often starts. Looking at your or someone else's dreams may therefore be a representation of what preoccupies the mind. I would be very hesitant to draw important meaning from one single dream, especially given how bizarre they can be, but it might be worth looking at underlying repeating patterns and then comparing those patterns to population averages. A number of books have been written dedicated to helping people interpret their dreams. Some are very specific. Horses symbolize success. Night symbolizes stress. Statues symbolize boredom with life. The idea that these things not only symbolize very specific things in waking life, but do so universally across cultures, nations, languages, sexes, ages, etc., does not really have much science behind it. Sometimes, people will tell me their dreams and ask me what I think it means. Despite all this research I've done on dreams, I don't often know what to say, especially if it's just one dream. If meaning can be drawn from dreaming, it would often be a very personal, subjective thing. When researchers look at the meaning behind dreams, they look less often at the idea of the subconscious mind trying to tell you something, and more at the notion that analyzing people's dreams provides a window into their minds. 
So, what types of things do we tend to dream about? Interestingly, there are some common themes across the world. Being chased, being nude or not dressed properly in public, being late to an important event, either by being lost or prevented by obstacles, being unable to find a location to something important, discovering a new area of a familiar location, such as a new room in your house, being killed by an unstoppable disaster, such as a tidal wave or the end of the world, both the deceased being alive in dreams as well as the living dying in dreams. These things tend to be very phantasmagoric for reasons we've mentioned. They're unrealistic. People or locations or stories can change on a dime without the dreamer really even noticing, all this sort of thing. The dreamer may come up with concepts or experience emotions that they never had in waking life, and perhaps never would have. As I mentioned earlier, almost everyone dreams, even fetuses. Fetuses most likely dream of only tactile or auditory sensations. Likewise, the blind dream. If they've been blind for life, they don't have visual dreams for obvious reasons. Babies too therefore dream, though it's not known what these dreams are like. A true legend of dream research was the American psychologist Calvin S. Hall, who, while living in the great land of Cleveland, Ohio, analyzed the content of around 50,000 dreams which he gathered throughout his career. His work indeed shows that the most common emotion felt in dreams is anxiety, and that negative emotions are more common than positive ones overall, though positive dreams are of course somewhat common. Dreams of a sexual nature are less common than people might think. Less than 10% of reported dreams pertain to sexual things, though in such studies of course numbers may be skewed because such dreams are embarrassing to report. Sexual dreams tend to be more common in adolescence. Men tend to dream of multiple partners, women of high status partners, such as celebrities. Fidelity is not exactly common in dreams for either gender, regardless of fidelity in waking life. Dreaming in black and white has gone down over time, but used to be more prevalent, very possibly related to the prevalence of black and white television. Women tend to spend 6-8% to more time than men describing their dreams. They also, on average, remember more. When time spent dreaming is controlled for, women also have more social interaction in their dreams than men, with more characters. Men tend to dream more about unfamiliar figures. Women dream 13% more often of familiar characters. Men dream more of physical aggression and fighting, and of unfamiliar and outdoor settings. One study, linked in the description, showed that young people most commonly reported dreams of monsters and animals, and half of their recurring dreams contain threatening elements. A 2004 study by Fogel et al. shows a relationship between intelligence and the likelihood of dreaming about useful information learned throughout the day, at least indirectly. Studies by Ernest Hartman seem to suggest that people who suffer from mental illness, unhealthy social life, and excessive stress have higher rates of nightmares than the average. People with personality disorders tend to experience trouble with dreams as well. As an example, those with borderline personality disorder seem to experience dream reality confusion more often than the average population, essentially meaning they may have slightly more trouble remembering what was real and what was a dream. People with BPD also have more disturbances during sleep. Those with personality disorders in general may have less dream activity in general. Drug withdrawal can cause more intense dreams, but ultimately any major change to neurochemistry can, or even just anything that disrupts sleep. Spicy food? Likely so. Eating before bed? Quite possibly. Cheese specifically? Not a whole lot of data on that. Around 67% of people report having experienced a repetitive dream at least once in their life. The elderly report fewer negative dreams, which is consistent with findings that they experience fewer negative emotions in waking life as they age. I've also performed my own surveys, to which many of you have contributed. Very grateful for that. My first question was, do you remember your dream from last night? As you can see here, overwhelmingly 44% of people said no. Of course, the majority of people said yes, but yes was divided into three other important categories. 16% vaguely could, 22% did, but forgot it soon after waking up, and only 18% of people remembered their last dream into their days. Of course, we had people answering this question all over the world at different times of day, so there are, of course, problems with these surveys are just meant as very general polls, not necessarily hard data. Secondly, I asked if you recall your last dream, what emotions did you feel in it? 
The majority, 29%, said they don't recall. The most common emotional response was, of course, negative emotions at 26%, followed by positive emotions at 18%, and neutral or no strong emotions at 16%, and other slash mixed at 11%. Thirdly, I asked, which of these dreams sounds the most familiar to you? A clear winner is being chased by a malevolent person or force, with over a third of all people picking that one. Second place was finding a new area of a familiar place, such as a new room in your house. And a close third was being late for school or work, slash not being able to find it. Statistics like these simply reinforce the notion that dreams are a window into different parts of our mind. We can use them with regard to the psychology of people in general, but you are able to do the same, perhaps in even greater detail on your own by keeping a dream journal and analyzing the content of your dreams. Whatever their content, whatever their origins, whatever their purpose, dreams will likely captivate us for as long as we have them, as they always have. The fact that we may be only beginning our scientific investigation of them only adds to their mystery. There are many things we still need to understand, many problems we need to have clarified, but perhaps for now, we should sleep on it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. We would appreciate donations on Patreon to help with the cost of producing these videos, a link to which you can find in the description. You can support the channel with as little as a $1 contribution, however, you can make my dreams come true by simply subscribing to our YouTube channel for free. A special thanks to our Patreon supporters listed here. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, so come check us out there too. Thank you for watching.